Hello and welcome to the sixth lecture video in the Sheridan College online degree breadth elective course, Introduction to Medieval History. So far in this course, we have covered over 500 years of history. From the rise of Christianity, the dying days of the Roman Empire, to the rise of Islam and the early Middle Ages. We've seen empires rise and fall, new peoples and new states. Over the centuries, we've seen the Western world transformed. In today's video, we'll move away from the narrative of medieval history and focus instead on the lives of medieval people. We'll see how the transformations beginning with the fall of the Roman Empire resulted in a unique medieval society. We'll take a look at medieval kingship and the noble warrior class epitomized by the medieval knight. We'll examine the concept of feudalism, a controversial and complex term for historians that is often misunderstood. We'll also examine the lives of medieval peasants and the institution of serfdom. In short, today, we'll try to understand what it was like to be alive in the Middle Ages. All that today in Introduction to Medieval History. The learning objectives for this lesson are Number one, understand the basic characteristics of medieval society and the distribution of power including medieval kings, nobles and peasants, and the Christian church. Number two, recognize the historiographical debate and problematic use of the term feudalism. And number three, describe the medieval manner and the institution of serfdom. In 987 CE, King Louis V fell off his horse and died. Louis was the last Carolingian ruler of Western Francia. He left no heirs. A powerful duke named Hugh Capet managed to gain enough support from the powerful landowners of the realm to become king. Soon after, Hugh made his son Robert, whom later generations would call Robert the Pious, his co-king. For the next 800 years, the Capetian dynasty would rule France until the French Revolution. Around the year 1000 CE, the Archbishop Aldebaro of Laon would write a poem for King Robert. In it, he described society as consisting of three parts. There were those that pray, others that fight, and still others that work. In the Latin, they were the oratores, bellatores, laboratores. Here in Aldebaro's poem, we have the first contemporary description of the medieval tripartite society, sometimes called the Three Estates. The idea that all of medieval society could essentially fall into these three groups, fighters, clergy, and peasants. But was it true? Is this an accurate way of understanding medieval society? What was it really like? The word that is often used to describe medieval society is feudalism or feudal society. Now, if you've studied medieval history before, you've most likely encountered it like this. A pyramid with a king at the top, the nobles in the middle, and the peasants at the bottom. Just Google it. The pyramid idea of medieval society is everywhere. But ask any medieval historian, and they'll tell you it didn't exist. The pyramid is a myth. Feudalism, or as some historians call it, the F word. The term was first used in the 17th and 18th centuries when Europeans looking into the past were trying to describe the complex structure of society and power arrangements that had existed throughout the Middle Ages. The term comes from the Latin word feodum, a word which means fief, a parcel of land given to another warrior or noble. The recipient of a fief was called a vassal, and the giver of one was called a lord. The fief was given in return for loyalty and service. The idea of the pyramid of feudalism was the idea that the king was the ultimate holder of land and gave fiefs to his noble warrior followers, who in turn owed them their obedience. The fief, therefore, was a relationship between nobles, 
And indeed, when modern historians do use the term feudal or feudalism, they are generally only referring to the nobles, to the fighters. The lowest classes, the peasants, were governed by a completely different set of customs that I'll cover later in the video. However, even when we are just looking at nobles, when you really examine the Middle Ages, there is really nowhere and no time when this pyramid perfectly existed. In fact, the whole term feudalism, a term which would have been foreign to any medieval person, is something that historians have increasingly been uncomfortable using at all. Since the mid-1970s, with the publication of historian Elizabeth Brown's article in the American Historical Review, The Tyranny of a Construct, many historians have begun to question the use of the term. Central to the problem is that the term feudalism implies a formal structure when in reality there was none. The society that emerged from the Middle Ages was organic, ever-changing, and far more messy and complex than a pyramid could ever indicate. If you've ever watched the HBO fantasy TV show Game of Thrones or read the books, you may have a closer idea to what it was actually like in the Middle Ages. And I don't mean the dragons. I mean the noble families and their alliances, where the title of a king is meaningless without power, without the support of others, where the local powerful noble families held complete control over their own lands and where power belongs to those who can wield it. Indeed, one of the central truths of the Middle Ages is that kings were actually very weak. The idea that they could enforce their laws everywhere was ludicrous. Power was local. Laws were local. Courts were controlled by the local noble or warlord. This was the reality of the Middle Ages. When the Roman Empire fell in the West, one of the major consequences was the absence of a central power. There was no central government enforcing the law. There was no central court system you could appeal to. The only power that mattered was whoever was the toughest, meanest warlord around. Someone who could protect the local inhabitants. Someone who could render justice for the local community. Power in the early Middle Ages increasingly became local. Now there were moments after the fall of Rome when for a brief time, a semblance of a central power re-emerged. But these were the exception rather than the rule. In Francia, the Merovingians, followed by the Carolingians, to a degree would exert some power across their land. However, even the great Emperor Charlemagne had to rely on the support of powerful Frankish warrior families. His army was not a standing army, not a permanent army. It was a temporary assembly made up of these powerful warrior families from across Francia. Charlemagne's strength relied on whether these warriors would come when he called them. And so to secure their loyalty, he ceded much of his power to local warlords. He gave them land called feodums or fiefs. The land was meant to support them being warriors, to give them revenue. The most important instrument of war in the Middle Ages was the mounted warrior, something which had marked the Franks from the beginning as a force to be reckoned with. Over time, Frankish cavalry became more sophisticated, armor became more extensive, horses became bigger, the time to train expanded to years. The medieval knight has become one of the most widely recognized images of the Middle Ages, and it is so for a reason. The knight was a fierce instrument of war, and the fief in part supported it. While not all knights had their own fief, they were all at least associated with another warrior who had one. The income required to support the equipment and training of a knight was not cheap. The fief, therefore, was the backbone of the medieval military class. On their fiefs, they could exact their own taxes. They could oppress the peasants as they saw fit. Charlemagne granted titles to some, comes, the Latin word for counts. They were the local rulers and administrators of areas called counties. That's what the word county means, a land ruled by a count. Later, Frankish kings would appoint men to oversee the defense of the borderlands called marches, and these positions were the 
marquis. All of these governmental appointments over time became hereditary, passing from father to son with the lands as their hereditary birthright. The titles became completely separated from their original meaning. During the Middle Ages, there was no formal hierarchy of titles. Titles were simply attached to hereditary lands. By the end of the early Middle Ages, there was very little, if any, central control. And Europe in the 10th and 11th centuries was a dangerous place. Violence was common. Invading armies, marauding pirates were all a part of everyday life. Whether it was the Saxons, the Vikings, the Magyars, there was always someone you needed to fear. But with the demise of the Carolingian Empire, you couldn't expect a faraway king to help you. If you wanted to survive, you came to depend on whoever was the local powerful warrior. As the warriors, who increasingly were considered the nobility, gained more and more power, kings in turn became weaker and weaker. And so, a better way of looking at the way power was distributed in the Middle Ages is not a pyramid, but a web. A web of relationships and loyalties in which the king is just one actor, and not necessarily the most important one. At the heart of each relationship was a lord and a vassal. A vassal was a noble warrior who was given land, a fief which became their hereditary right to pass on. In return, the vassal swore an oath to their feudal lord. While the promises and customs associated with these oaths varied wildly across time and space, it usually meant a promise of military support. That for a certain number of days per year, you would fight for your lord. However, not all fiefs were the same size. Some were small, others very large. A vassal with a large fief could in turn subdivide their fief and create vassals of their own, each one becoming hereditary over time. And this is the important part and why a pyramid does not really work to describe the system. A vassal only owed allegiance to their immediate lord, not their lord's lord. So if a vassal chose to revolt against their lord, they could take their vassals with them even more complex. A man could be a vassal of many different lords, each relationship based on a different fief that he held as his property. Loyalties could be very complex. One of the most clear examples of why these feudal relationships can't be viewed as a pyramid is Normandy, an area of northwest France. During the 9th century, the Vikings frequently raided the coast of France, or Francia as it was known then. In the wake of the Carolingian civil wars, these attacks got worse. In the late 8th century, the Viking leader Hrolfer, or more commonly known as Rollo, besieged the city of Paris itself. The Frankish kings were forced to pay huge sums of money to the Vikings just so that they would go away. But year after year, the Vikings returned to raid again. In 911 CE, the king of West Francia, Charles the Simple, was desperate. He cut a deal with the Viking leader Rollo. If Rollo promised to stop attacking them, and moreover to help defend the kingdom against other Vikings, then Charles would grant him land in the north of Francia for his people to settle on. Rollo agreed, and even married the king's daughter Gisela to seal the deal. This land that Rollo received would eventually bear the Viking name, Normandy, or Northmen's Land. Rollo's heirs would be the Dukes of Normandy, and technically they were now vassals of the King of France. But Normandy had been given to the Vikings because the French king was weak, not because he was strong. Over a century later, in 1066 CE, the Anglo-Saxon King of England, Edward the Confessor, died without a clear heir. The Duke of Normandy, William I, descendant of Rollo, decided to take advantage of the situation and cross the English Channel with his army. At the Battle of Hastings, he defeated the English and effectively conquered England, becoming the new English king. But when he became king, William did not give up his lands in Normandy. He still held the title of Duke there. And as such, William was still technically a vassal of the King of France, 
So when William conquered England, did this effectively bring the Kingdom of England under the control of the King of France? Absolutely not. The King of France had no claim to England. It was William's. William's vassalage relationship with the King of France was only with respect to Normandy. Moreover, William was powerful, in fact, maybe more so than the King of France. So while William remained a vassal of the French king, after 1066, he was also now a powerful king in his own right. You can see why a pyramid would not really describe the reality of noble power in the Middle Ages. But what about the other two categories in Bishop Aldebaro's threefold division of medieval society? For the peasants, it mattered little who was the king. The king far away had no impact on your life. Power and authority were local in the Middle Ages. The most important authority in a peasant's life was their lord, usually a noble upon whose fief they lived and farmed. But it wasn't always a noble. Medieval monasteries could also be landowners too. In that case, the monastery took the place of the lord and exacted the same authority over the peasants. Life for medieval peasants was based around what historians call the manor. The manor was the basic component of the medieval economy. A manor was essentially an agricultural estate. It consisted of land farmed by peasants, a medieval manor house, which could be a castle or a building where the lord might live, or a monastery when it took the place of a lord, and a small village for the peasants to live in. Most peasants during the Middle Ages were serfs, sometimes called Velaines. Serfs were essentially tenant farmers who faced many restrictions on their lives. It is said that a serf is tied to the land. They are not allowed to move. They must continue to farm for their entire lives. Moreover, serfdom was an inherited condition. If your parents were serfs, then you would be too, and your children one day as well. Most historians believe that serfdom arose in Europe as a natural evolution from slavery, which had been the bedrock of the old Roman Empire. However, while there are some similarities between serfdom and slavery, there are also some very important differences too. A slave does not own their own body. In Roman times, slaves were essentially the property of their owners, little different from livestock. They had no rights whatsoever. A serf, on the other hand, is not owned by their lord, but rather they are under what might be thought of as a forced contractual obligation. A serf had to work a certain number of days per year farming the lord's land, called the demence. There were also other obligations too. They might have to pay rent, a certain amount of customary food gifts. They had to ask permission to marry, to travel outside their manor. Now, the specific rules could vary widely between manners. However, outside these rules, a serf was independent. They fed themselves by farming their own small parcels of land. They built their own houses, made their own clothing. They were considered people, and they had rights. In fact, it was one of the responsibilities of their lord to ensure that their rights were maintained. The Lord was responsible first and foremost for keeping their peasants safe, but they were also required to provide a means of justice. A Lord would preside over a manor court periodically throughout the year. Peasants from across the manor could bring their complaints and cases to the court to be heard. Often the manor court would also have a jury which was made up of the elder peasant men of the manor. If you were upset that your neighbor was stealing your onions or letting his cow eat your flowers, then off to the manor court you would go. In fact, surviving manor court records are some of the best sources available to historians to try to understand the lives of medieval peasants. The fundamental deciding factor in most cases at the manor court was custom. What was the custom of that manor? Customs were unwritten sets of rules and precedents which extended back hundreds of years. However, the variations of rules and expectations for peasants were as varied as the feudal relationships of their lords. Every manor was different. The third division of medieval society in Europe was the Christian Church. 
Here too, the reality that existed in the Middle Ages was far more complex than most contemporary depictions would allow. The church existed alongside the secular world. Nearly every village would have a small church and a parish priest. Monasteries were extremely common across the medieval landscape and over time became important landowners too. Entering into the church for a career was really only an option that was open to the nobility. Most monasteries, for example, required a sizable donation from your family if you wanted to become a monk or nun. Most often, these positions were for the younger children of noble families who were not going to inherit the family lands. A career in the church was an attractive alternative. Life in the church offered some attractions. It could be a comfortable life. Members of the clergy were some of the few people in medieval society that became literate, that could read and write. During the Middle Ages, very, very few people could read and write. In fact, most kings were illiterate. But a monk or a nun could expect to receive an education. However, the standards of education were often very low. Paris priests, for example, were usually just barely literate, memorizing the prayers and services that they would need to conduct and knowing little else. Often the structure of the church is depicted as a pyramid too, with the Pope at the top, bishops in the middle, and priests at the bottom. However, although the medieval church had a more structured hierarchy than feudal society, it was not so clear-cut. First of all, popes did not have nearly as much power as you might think. Outside of Rome, the greatest power a pope had was influence. He had no army and no means of enforcement. Most bishops were not appointed by popes, but rather by secular leaders such as kings, dukes, or emperors. Even parish priests were usually assigned by feudal lords with little to no input from church authorities. However, this would change. In the High Middle Ages, the church would begin a reform movement, which would transform its role and greatly increase its power. We are now officially halfway through this course, and I hope you've enjoyed it so far. In our next lesson, two weeks from now, we will begin our three-part exploration of the High Middle Ages. Across the Old World, we'll see the resurgence of cities and the expansion of the medieval economy. We'll see the reform of the Christian church and the first real struggles with the secular leaders for control and power. In the East, we'll see the rise of a new people, the Seljuk Turks, who will rise up to become a powerful force that will eventually overshadow the Byzantine Empire itself. We'll also see the Christian and Islamic world go to war in the First Crusade. The High Middle Ages will see the flowering and the pinnacle of medieval culture. All that in two weeks in Introduction to Medieval History.